This video, unfortunately, is about airborne Ebola. It's not a video I'm excited to be making, but there's a news story that came across my radar that you probably want to know about. I love the chase and the hunt, and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want, and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now waiting, better believe in your mind, because it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. Just a few days ago, there was a 63-year-old man on a flight from Thailand to Germany, and he ended up dying with symptoms that are very reminiscent of an Ebola or a Marburg virus. I was uh, tipped off to this story by Southern Prepper One, uh, and I did my research, actually, you know, went and looked to original sources. That's always a good idea, not that I don't trust Southern Prepper One, but, you know, whenever you get into a telephone game, like Southern Prepper One says something, and then I just repeat it to you, and then you repeat it to someone else, there's always a little bit of uh, opportunity for errors to kind of leach into that. So so it's always good to go back to original sources. And uh, I was able to confirm the story and I wanted to share it with you guys uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, before I get into it, the first thing I wanna say right off the bat is that this 63 year old uh, man is a person with a family and it's important to remember that. It's, you know, it's a tragic event for you know, that person and their family that they had to go through this. This isn't like a PSYOP, this isn't some kind of predictive programming. This person wasn't a crisis actor, they're an actual person with an actual family. And it's important to think about that. But the second thing that's important to uh, keep in mind is that you know when you see something like this happen it's it's a good opportunity to think to yourself well what would I do in the situation uh, because there were a lot of other people that were on the flight with that person uh, now this reminds me an awful lot of the book, The Hot Zone. Uh, if you haven't read The Hot Zone book, it's a really good read. It's enter well, I guess, yeah, it's, ent it's an entertaining book. It's about true, actual events that, uh, you know, happened here, uh, you know, around the world and specifically in, in the United States uh, several decades ago where Marburg virus seems to have started to become airborne in a certain uh, situation. Uh, that situation was able to be contained and hopefully completely destroyed uh, and wiped out and not kept in some lab somewhere to leak out later. Um, but there were situations in that book where somebody had developed um, this illness and they were traveling in a plane and they started bleeding out of the mouth and uh, you know eyes and those symptoms are very similar to what was happening to the the gentleman that that died recently uh, the description in the news article that I read was that liters of blood were coming up out of his mouth now this really could be all sorts of different things it's not definitely Marburg it's not definitely Ebola but it certainly gets you thinking about that what if you were one of the people that was on that plane with that person what if you were in a situation where you know suddenly it became really obvious that there was something potentially dangerous and maybe that potentially dangerous thing was in the air. Now I know with us all having gone through COVID, many people reacted to that in a in many different ways. My reaction to it was to always uh, err on the side of caution. It's worked out really well for me in the past five years. I haven't had any illnesses at all because I started using protocols. Never got COVID, never got anything else uh, over the past uh, several years. So the, you know, the protocols that I've been using have worked. Other people have reacted in other ways where when they were told to do things, they kind of pushed back and uh, uh, you know, kind of cr created different uh, mythologies about things. When they were told by the government it was a good idea to mask, granted the government suggested you wear these crappy masks that don't do anything, but when people were told to mask, uh, they didn't like being told what to do, so people kind of created these, uh, again, mythologies about how, well, masks don't work anyway. Um, you know, the reality has a lot more shades of gray to it. You know, some masks work in some certain circumstances, some masks work in other circumstances. There's some situations where, you know, mask or not, it's going, not going to help you. And certainly the idea of being told to do th uh, something, especially when you're being told to do something foolishly, like wearing a mask that doesn't even work, it, it has that kind of automatic pushback against those kind of ideas. So coming out of COVID, there's all sorts of people that have different views on what they would or wouldn't bother doing in some kind of a disease outbreak. And you know, people can keep whatever mythologies they want, you know, whatever religious belief you have. And a lot of people's thinking about disease and infection and virus at this point are kind of on a religious level. Uh, and that goes, you know, on both sides. There's the people that have said that, you know, illnesses, uh, 
aren't, aren't even real. Viruses aren't even real. It's all like people's 5G telephones uh, that are making them sick. And then you have other people on the other end of the spectrum where they'd be like out hiking in the woods all by themselves and they, and they were in a respirator. So there's all sorts of like, like religious thinking on both sides of the spectrum that is not based on science or reality. And, uh, you know, I welcome you to come back into the middle because you can really improve your life in a lot of ways if you just kind of keep things to reality, even if, you know, the government is being irritating and trying to, you know, push you around and whatever. It doesn't mean that you have to flee to whatever the opposite of the government is saying, because, you know, you know, some of the recommendations of the government actually were effective. And I like to utilize the ones that are effective and ignore the ones that aren't effective. And one of the uh, aspects of uh, what I've been doing is using respirators. I've got a couple of different types here. This is one that I wear at this point when I go out during cold and flu season. I don't throw it up on my face all the time. You know, during COVID when you had to, I had it up. But now what I do is I just kind of keep it down here. I neck it. And if I'm you know going to the grocery store and I, I walk up to a cashier and they're like dripping out the nose and clearly ill, it's like, you know, pop it up and I'll use it for that uh, time period. So that's what I've been doing with this, but this isn't really like a travel mask. This is something I've got, it's in a bag, it's in my car. And whenever I, you know, I'm driving around, I just have this with me and, you know, I'll pop it on when I'm going to go into an area where there may be ill people. So I have the option to throw it on. But there's other situations where you don't necessarily want to have something like this because this is, you know, it's, it's three dimensional. It doesn't really fold up super easily. Um, and I've got another one that I want to share with you guys that is of similar quality. And I keep it in this little bag here that I keep in my, uh, my everyday carry backpack. And this is another type of mask that uh, is, would be a good option if you were going to be traveling and you don't necessarily want to be having a mask on you because, you know, I've found, it's been my experience that you, having them on 24 seven, it's, it's completely unnecessary. You don't need them when you're hiking out in the woods all by yourself. You don't need them when you're driving in the car by yourself. You don't need them when you're out walking outside and even if there's a crowd, it's not really that big of a deal. But if you are in an enclosed space with somebody that's uh, sick, it's nice to be able to pop something like this on. So I, I got these and these are fold up masks and they're kind of similar to a lot of the um, uh, KN95 masks that people were wearing. Uh, but the nice thing about this is that it's an actual N95 mask. So you've got better filtering material and something like this is really handy to just have in, on your person, have on your backpack, have on your travel uh, stuff. So that if you were ever in a situation where let's say like you're on a flight or on a, like on a bus with someone and somebody clearly is, I guess a bus is a little bit easier because you'd be like, bus driver, stop, I'm getting off right here. <laughs> or whatever that guy is, I don't want to have, I don't want to share any of it. Um, you know, an airplane that, you, that requires a parachute for that type of uh, situation. So, uh, you know, it just makes sense to kind of have that kind of stuff. Again, I know people have developed a lot of, um, you know, political, um, magical thinking, kind of mythological ideas around these things. Uh, but, you know, there is a reality. There is a core reality. Uh, and, uh, you know, disease spreads through many different ways. One of those ways occasionally is that aerosolized particles of the virus kind of float around. If you get that stuff into your body, you know, it may fall on the right receptor or may not fall on the right receptor, but if it does fall on the right receptor and starts being able to multiply itself, then, you know, you become another human Petri dish. And all of the enthusiasm in the world that you may have for whatever your political ideology might be, it doesn't matter how much ideology you have and how much you believe it, you know, Viruses get in your body and they land in the right place, they're gonna multiply, you know, no matter how strongly you, you, know, you hold your beliefs. So I think it's a good idea just to have it in your back pocket, uh, you know, literally or figuratively, I guess literally in your back pocket probably wouldn't be the best idea because you'd be like rubbing it all the time whenever you sit down, but have it, you know, somewhere ar around near you so that if you're ever in a situation where you would like to have some kind of filtration between you and anything, and it could be somebody who is vomiting blood out of their face, or it could be, you know, I mean, just somebody that looks like they have an awful cold or flu or completely getting away from disease. If you were in an area and there was just like suddenly like a lot of, a lot of pollution or a dust storm or, you know, like a wildfire, uh, you know, kind of starts blowing through an area or, you know, nuclear radioactive fallout, you know, now there's all sorts of other issues with nuclear radioactive fallout. Uh, but you know, if you can prevent it from at least going into your lungs, you know, that's, that's one additional uh, way that you can, you know, help to protect yourself. So I think having some of these kind of fold up masks and having them in your everyday carry items makes a lot of sense. I've been doing it for a long time. I've never used it. I've never needed to use these, but it's nice to have them just in case. And that's what prepping is all about. Hopefully we never have to use any of this stuff, but when you need it, it's nice to have it. That's it. Thanks for watching. 
Hey YouTube preppers, if you enjoyed this video, here's another one that I think you might like. But before you click on it, I wanted to take a moment to thank all the people on the right hand side of your screen. They help to support all the work that I do here over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to join them and get your name added to the list, the link's below.